here with John Ramdean and Robin Black as we are getting set for the UFC's return to London, England on Saturday. The weigh-ins went down on Friday. Anderson Silva came in at 186 pounds, Michael Bisping at 185. Both looking very good at the weigh-ins, and I, I think that the interest for this particular fight, uh, this is the biggest fight they have ever put on Fight Pass. I think that's going to be interesting coming out of this as well, is just that service and its continued growth. This is certainly something they didn't need to do for a sold-out venue at the mm -hmm. O2 Arena, but this is clearly their initiative on, on Fight Pass of putting solid fights, and there isn't a bigger one they've put together than this yeah, one. And they're just giving, they continue to give people reasons to uh, get themselves involved in Fight Pass. You know, the Eddie, Eddie Bravo Invitational, Glory there, and this massive fight with M Michael Bisping and Anderson Silva. He's got the embedded treatment, getting everybody excited for one of the greatest fights at 185 pounds. Uh, I, I just look at it as a sigh of relief. These guys stepped on the scale, Anderson Silva makes weight, we knew Michael Bisping would make weight. Not that we didn't think Anderson Silva would make weight, but over the last couple of fights, it's like, okay, what are we gonna get from Anderson Silva? Uh, Robbins pointed it out a number of times, he's 40 years old, it's not the same Anderson Silva that we we imagine in our mind as one of the greatest of all times, but the fact is that they weighed in, they're ready to go, and you see Anderson Silva playing the alpha male, moving forward, and yes, Dana White's pushing Michael Bisping back but I just love the, uh, the mentality of Anderson Silva right here. Yeah, there's a game at play too. I, it, um, Pollock asked me when we did the weigh-ins on Friday morning uh, about when we looked at Holly Holm versus Ronda Rousey and we saw Ronda kind of freak out at the weigh-ins and you could use that and identify that something was up, that she was affected, that maybe that would play a part in, uh, in her fight. And uh, there are times where that is not really the case. And the times that it's not the case are the times where both guys are just so comfortable with that kind of thing. Next weekend, we're going to see a weigh-in between Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor. And leading up to that, everything is going to be interesting. They're going to jaw at each other. They're going to entertain the audience. But because they're both so mentally strong and so comfortable in that kind of chaos, I don't think you can read as much into it. And I think that's the case here with Bisping and with Anderson Silva. you got 75 fights between these guys or more. You know, you start including fights that didn't get recorded, yeah. that early in their careers happened in garages. They're so experienced. They've been through everything. I think it'll come down to the moments that they walk into the cage, who's in the better shape. One last thing, Bisping was wearing a t-shirt. Does he have a dad bod under there? Uh, Anderson. Yeah, uh, Anderson was wearing a t-shirt. Is there, is there a dad bod going I on under there? I think he's probably there? sponsored by Reebok. Well, <laughs> yes, but most people don't do that. We'll see. What kind of shape is he really physically in? Because Bisping sure enjoyed needling him. He's been on steroids his whole career. Well, we don't know that. All we know is he took some kind of weird uh, bone or juice to, uh, who knows, he failed a drug test. So uh, now will he look different? He's been tested a lot of times, so he's a clean athlete right now, but a 40-year-old clean athlete who has at least one time used steroids, he may not look all that fit. Do you feel that some people have just heightened Anderson Silva's performance against Nick Diaz? It wasn't the greatest Anderson Silva performance. It was, it was certainly at the, at the lower level, if not the mm -hmm. lowest level we've ever seen him perform at. However, I think people have taken that, and it's just been, well, it's, he's now a year older. Anderson Silva is done. He's declined. And I think you watch this fight, and at the end of the day, he did win this fight, even if it is now turned into a no contest. Are we somewhat discounting Anderson Silva, John? Yeah, because look at there. Look at the su stuff Anderson Silva is doing against Nick Diaz, the former Strike Force champion who has faced some of the best fighters at 170 or 185 pounds. I mean, he fought Robbie Lawler, he fought George St. Pierre, he's faced Carlos Condit. Anderson Silva coming back after that serious injury, you would expect him to not have the best performance of his career. I think it was very important that he just gets that out of the way, which he did, and then focus. I think his body language at the weigh-ins tells you that he's in a different place than he was in that fight against Nick Diaz. Yeah, man, it's really tough to say. You know, we showed you, nine, not even, probably 60 seconds of highlights from a 25-minute yeah. fight. That was the best week at yeah. Muster. You know, he had a spinning kick that didn't land. He had one moment of retreating and intercepting him on the way in. Uh, it was his one of his worst performances. His worst performance in modern fighting. Now, is that an anomaly? Or is that what we should expect now if 100% of his fights, since he has lost, broken his leg, and had, you know, possible drug issues, have been a mediocre performance? What evidence is there to think that we're going to turn back the clock? The gr best performance he's had in the last half decade is Yushin Okami. Stefan Bonner, of course, was pretty brilliant <laughs> in its own right, but that's a different level than we're looking at here. You hope Anderson Silva has a wonderful performance, can go out and turn back the clock and enjoy himself in that cage. 
Gegard Mousasi, he'll be meeting Talos Leites. I think outside of the main event, this is the fight I'm most intrigued by on this card. I think that, that Talos Leites is an excellent middleweight. And I feel that if we get a 100% Gegard Mousasi, this is going to be an outstanding fight and one that's very relevant within the 185 pound rankings. I have to agree 100% uh, Talos Leites. One of the things that we've been talking about over the last uh, week or so is the improvements he's made in the striking department. We all know about his jiu-jitsu. You just go back to his Rumble on the Rock days and then when he would make his way into the UFC, you know, having that uh, Novo Nyao crest means that you are more than competent on the ground in jiu-jitsu. But Andre Pettineros has done a great job of teaching those Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys, the Marlon Sandros, the Henan Barraos, and the Jose Aldos. Not, no longer are they jiu-jitsu fighters, they're stand-up guys because that's how you make the money. And Talos Leitas has definitely embraced that, but he's facing a guy that, in my opinion, is one of those one of the most well-rounded fighters. And I know that's a blanket term, but Gegard Mousasi never seems to be stressed out in any position that he's in, even if it's Jacare on top of him with him on his back. So I think that that's one of his biggest strengths is that he just embraces whatever position that he's in and he tries to win those positions. We used to say that fights were style versus style and styles make fights and all those kinds of things. And then as people did become well-rounded, became sort of the George St. Pierre uh, prototype, uh, we couldn't say that anymore. Now we actually can again. You've got your fluid, flowy fighters who, fly, who fight with different angles and different circles mm -hmm. and a lot of movement. And then you've got your pressure fighters with good jiu-jitsu if you, they force you to take it down. That's what we're looking at here. This is going to be a very interesting fight. It's a cool fight with cool fighters, but technically very interesting because Musasi is very much a part of that movement mm. movement. And Talos Ladies uh, is part of that style where you try to pressure somebody into forcing the takedown. It's going to be cool. And then the, the main card, it also rounds out with Tom Breeze taking on Keita Nakamura and Brad Pickett meeting Francisco Rivera. These are, some, these are some interesting fights. Uh, Tom Breeze, I think, is someone everyone has their eye on. And this bantamweight fight, I mean, this could very well be our, our fight of the night on, on Saturday. Yeah, it could. I mean, you just have to look at Brad Pickett's career. This is what he's known as one punch for a reason because he's always prepared. But if the opportunity presents itself, he's laying his opponent out. Yeah, and the audience obviously love Brad Pickett. Brad Pickett, uh, Pollock and I chatted with him, I guess, six months ago, and he was talking about creating a senior citizen fighting organization that he would like to be on the front end of. He's got a great sense of humor. I think that's already intellectual property of Spike. <laughs> yeah, already, yeah. He's got a great sense of humor and a great sense of combat. He wants to be close into you. It made sense from a reach perspective for him to go down to flyweight, but then all of a sudden, when put into flyweight, it didn't make sense from a positioning standpoint. Those guys are super mobile. He wants you to stand in there with him. He wants you to throw hooks while he slips inside with uppercuts and tight hooks and straight punches. If he can get deeper into that fight with Cisco, he, it favors him. On the way in, cisco has got crazy precision with his outside shots. This one's just simple. They're going to both make $50,000 and everyone's going to love it. I think it's something to watch this year because this is becoming more and more prevalent and it ties into the entire weigh-in discussion is how many fighters have that sense that a Brad Pickett did and many others are starting to have of how much am I giving up at this lower weight class versus what I'm gaining at it. Fighting at a closer weight to my walk around weight, how much more sense does that make? Conor McGregor, this guy is, I guarantee you, no, no less than 180 pounds now. Yeah. He's probably 185 pounds. He probably should be fighting at 170. And this is our 145 pound champion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that this is a landscape change that based on some key results over the next couple of weeks, I think a lot of guys are going to be paying attention to this. True, but it's also the opportunity. For example, Brad Pickett going down to 125 pounds, the idea is you win one, you win two fights, you could be fighting for the UFC championship. And that is the goal for the majority of fighters because if you get yourself into that number one spot, you're able to uh, parlay that into other opportunities. And like Michael Bisping said, everybody's in this game for one reason, that's to make the most money possible. Yeah, if we look at Tom Breeze face to face with his opponent as an example, and it's an example from the weigh-ins on Friday morning. Tom Breeze, very big, very muscular, cut down, super lean, kind of that generation of weight cutter. And there you see his opponent, Nakamura. He is leaner, he's lighter. He could be fighting at 155, but you'll see when these guys go face to face, what the advantage, look at that, Jeez. look at that. The, that is the advantage of advanced modern weight cutting, is he will inflate, he'll be a 200 pounder, Nakamura will be, 
178 pounds, and that is an enormous advantage. But as the game changes, that big weight cutting is a part of wrestling heavy fighting, wrestling oriented fighting where the wrestling is the anchor. That weight is, is an additional advantage. But as guys where mobility is the anchor to their fighting game, that weight cut is not gonna be as valuable. So if you see more Stephen Thompsons beating Johnny Hendrixes in the world, you'll see uh, more guys not cutting the same amount of weight as that sea change of fighting happens. Final thought. Fight of the night, John Ramdean. Put you, what is going to be the best fight ever coming up on Saturday? Uh, I, I, really, how can you, uh, you, you, talk, you think about Bragg Pickett uh, every time he's in, in action, always exciting. But you have to look at the main event. Yeah. Michael Bisping, Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva, you, all you have to do is look at his history, look at his highlights, and same with Michael Bisping. Bisping always tends to bring out the best in his opponent. I think the main event is going to deliver uh, fireworks. You're right. I, I said only a couple of minutes ago that Pickett will stand in there, Cisco will look with his hooks and Pickett inside. They'll both make 50 and they'll be happy. I think I just bought into what Pickett wants us to buy into, and that is to forget that his wrestling has yeah. really advanced down at ATT. And if he can get Cisco to buy into that and take him down, he'll look to make 50 and not take a lot of damage and let Cisco make nothing. I agree, it'll be the main event, I think. You know what Brad decides to do when he strikes? <laughs> oh, pick, pick his it. spots. <laughs> you pick it. <laughs> it's coming up on Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, our live preview show, counting down to Anderson Silva and Michael Bisping with the main card airing here on Fight Network in Canada with four fights from London, England's O2 Arena, kicking off with Francisco Rivera and Brad Pickett and your main event at 185 pounds, Anderson Silva and Michael Bisping.